we find ourselves during a critical time in history, particularly as young people, a time in which we must discover a generational mission for the sake of our nation and future generations, a time in which young people and institutions of high learning are systematically excluded due to government failures and institutional cultures. We have more than 6 million young people that are not in education, employment, or training. We have more than 9 million people that are unemployed in South Africa. We have young men and women who stand on the streets seeking employment whilst they have qualifications. There is political and financial instability in our country. Corruption and looting have become the order of the day. We find ourselves during a time where refugee camps are known, a time where women no longer feel safe in their own country, a time in which those who are supposed to protect us have oppressed us, a time in which we have an angry youth that believes democracy has failed them, and so they resort to the streets. A time, in essence, where we have young men and women whose dreams have been denied, who find themselves in limbo in our country. You will be a living testimony that one can rise above the circumstances of a growth. You will become an example of what one can do when they set their minds and are determined to achieve. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, let me firstly apologize for my voice. I unfortunately am not feeling too well, um, but I'm a woman of my word, and so I needed to honor the obligation to be here. More than anything, I am very humbled and surprisingly nervous. <laughs> I am not sure if it was a speech um, from Dr. Malapo that touched me very deeply. Um, it's not because I was also born in a poor family. It's not because I also went to a government school and then a model system. It's not because I know the bird you speak of, because there's none at home, but it's because I'm inspired that beyond your circumstances, you're able to stand here. And so I want to appreciate and commend each and every one of you that are sitting here. Ironically enough, you've achieved something I've never achieved. And so you ought to be proud to be here. Top 100 is not a child's play. It's not, especially with the turmoil and challenges that we see in our country today. To even be in an institution of higher learning is unfortunately a privilege. We are told that you have a right to education, yet being in an institution of higher learning is seen as a privilege. Basic education is seen as a public good, yet university is seen as a private good. We need to fix that. A government that does not educate its people suppresses them. Now, allow me to submit to you I know I'm supposed to speak about my journey. Um, it's very difficult because I don't like talking about myself. And you'd find that even on the program, they only mention two things that I do. Because it's not about what you read. It's the actions that must become louder, not what they say. And I hope that this is something you, all of us will take. It doesn't matter having a CV that's about 30 pages, yet you've never had an impact, not even a single person's life. It doesn't matter coming here to make daunting speeches, yet on the ground of not implementing that which I speak. And this is something we need to take away. And this is something why I appreciate the sponsors that we have here today, who are determined to use young people to become vessels and agents of change. We are not simply saying, hey, we're promoting social justice, yet when you get to the ground, you're not doing that. And so forgive me for not dwelling too much on who I am but why I do what I do. You see, it's very important for you to know why you do what you do. Because if you can't answer the why, the what or the how is going to be inadequate. If you do not give the right diagnosis, the cure is going to be incomplete. Now, there is no quotation that I appreciate. Well, this is actually my second favorite. The first one is Martin Luther King, JR. He says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. He doesn't say about things that matter to me or the most, but the day we as members of society become silent, our lives have fundamentally ended. And so the responsibility to change society does not simply lie with government officials, but society which we represent. And so I would hope that when we have these discussions, 
with interactions, we understand and we speak truth and we challenge the status quo to eradicate social injustices. Doesn't matter whether you're in business, marketing, law, or accounting. Whatever it is or skill or talent that you have ought to be used to not only for your own success, but to transform society as well. Because by the way, it would be nice for you to live in Santon, nice apartment, drive a Jaguar, have a Range Rover on the side. But if there's a junk status, it's going to affect you as well. If there's a recession, it's going to affect you as well. So effectively, if our economy, if society is running adequately, we live a better life, all of us. We cannot operate with the notion that if I am fine, then the rest shall see itself. Now, most importantly, I want to not present my story for sympathy. I don't like that thing. I don't see myself as a victim. I am, I'm a young black female. I don't see myself as a victim. And I think my past record would prove that adequately. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering, how did at the age of 21, I became the first SRC president of my institution? And how did at the age of 24, I became the youngest member of parliament? It's okay, I think everyone knows it now. I always make a joke that I'm the one female that everyone's age they will know. If you just go on Google, um, it pops up. So I'm proudly 24. Uh, proudly South African, proudly black, and proudly female. Now, <laughs> if there's a quotation that best describes who I am, it comes from Malcolm X. Now, many of my friends say I like quoting dead people. <laughs> and I just think it's because I've already seen how their lives turn out, so I'm quite fine with it. I don't want to get attached to a leader today, uh, and then they collapse tomorrow, and I'm like, I've lost inspiration. But even more to it, it shows us that we should never be dependent or look unto people. Draw strength from their positive attributes, but also understand that you're own person. So that if he fails, I am not deterred, nor disappointed, but understand that he's a human being, and I will track, I take that which is good of him. Now, Malcolm X argues that I am for truth, whoever tells it. I am for justice, whoever it is for or against. But first and foremost, I am a human being. As such, and for whoever and whatever benefits humanity. If you want a summary of why I am why I am today, or who I am, that quotation is a fulfillment. That I stand for humanity, I stand to advocate for the next person. Now, I was born and raised in Eastern Cape, in Port Elizabeth, in a township called Motherwell, which is one of the biggest townships in society. Now, I've always been a child who questioned the status quo. So you find that when you go, for those who stayed in the location, when you go to town, you have to take a taxi. But why don't we have a car? You know, now we must carry these groceries or we must buy half today and come back tomorrow because we don't have space. And secondly, why do we stay, all of us staying here black? Where's, but when I go to town or the mall, I see different people. So I always had these questions, but my parents were very protective. And for those who are parents, I'm sure you understand why. And I'm an only child, which makes it worse because all the attention is always on me. But I questioned things. And this one day I was sitting with my father. We have a very close relationship. So he'd be watching rugby. Now he's a huge fan of rugby, actually any sport. So I'm that girl who grew up watching sports. And the Springboks were playing the All Blacks. Maybe it's still too soon to move. <laughs> but <laughs> they were playing together. And so my dad was cheering for the All Blacks. I was like, what? This is frustrating. Why would you cheer for them? So he says, you're too soon to understand. You're too young, rather, to understand. I'm like, Pops, that's very wrong. You can't judge me based on my age. And he, they laugh it off. So a few years later, we actually go to another game. And I ask him, why? I mean, we're born in South Africa, we're part of South Africa. Why would you support a foreign team? So he sits down with me and explains how he was very much passionate about rugby. He was gifted, it was his talent. And he played for the local rugby team. But because of the color of his skin, he could not play for the national team. You know, I was, I didn't understand fully. I was very confused. I was like, sure, well, this is deep. So you're telling me because of the color of your skin, you couldn't do something. He says, yeah. I said, okay, um, it's fine. 
but I will go back to the story when I come to, to the end. But just keep it there. And so growing up as my daddy's little girl, because my mother had to work in East London, which was also problematic that we couldn't all be home together. So for 10 years, um, shout out to all the fathers there who are very supportive of their children. I was raised by this man. So you can imagine I was very boyish. I used to cut my hair with him. I uh, wore my, oh, my soccer pants. I played with the boys. I was, I was just that girl. And I'm sure he gets shocked every day when he sees me in dresses and heels. He's like, what happened to my little girl? I'm like, no, she's still there. The values are still there. The principles are still there. But they're just like different things now. But what I appreciate about being raised by my father, he allowed me to become a critical thinker. He allowed me to become my own person. He did not say because you're a girl, you must play with dolls. He did not define me based on the stereotypes of society. And that is something fundamental that we need to take. Don't let someone define you. Don't let someone dictate your behavior. Break the boundaries. Become the exception to the norm. And so I always argue in the higher education and basic education committee to say, don't, you must teach kids to think, not what to think. Today in society, we are programmed to believe that you must go to primary school, high school, if you go to VITS, you sit here, no offense to those who study there, then you've made it in life, and then you must go get a job. No one teaches us to create employment, to become the employer. We are all programmed to believe that you must go submit a CV and find work. I'm not challenging the companies here who want CV submitted. <laughs> but I'm simply making a point that if you're brilliant enough to make it to the top 100, why can you not create your own company? Why can you not assist with the 6 million young people who are not in employment or education or training? We must become solutions to society's problems. We must become an asset with whatever you have studied in society. I must use my LLB to become a vehicle of change. No one's, th this, there's this whole conception and notion that I can only help people if I'm a doctor. And unfortunately, I also wanted to become a doctor because my mom was a nurse and she was very passionate about helping people. So I thought I'm going to go study um, medicine. But this is in high school now, in grade nine, and I'm choosing subjects. And I choose science, life sciences, maths. I hated accounting because if you put one zero, the whole thing is wrong. Um, it's like, I'm not going to go do geography. Come on, I can see when the sun's coming out. What am I going to do? So I took history. It's like, well, this is boring, and I've generally been at writing essays. And I got to grade 10. Um, I still loved my maths and science. History was very boring. I mean, teaching about the Aztec, the Anglo Boer War. Um, so you just passed. Then in grade 11, you started learning about South African history. Ah, the civil rights movement. I'm like, this is nice. I'm enjoying it until we started watching videos of the TLC, which goes back to my dad's story. And you see the brutality. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable, it's fine. Sometimes we need to have critical dialogues as a nation. And you watch these documentaries, and something inside me moved. I was not there when apartheid happened. I was actually two in 1994 when we had our first democratic election. But something in me at that instant said, I'm going to become a human rights activist. I'm going to become a lawyer. Never again should anyone suffer because of their color of their skin, because of their gender, because of their race or ethnicity. We all should fundamentally get the same benefits from the rights that we have. The Bill of Rights must not simply become a paper, a document. It must manifest and materialize in our lives. That's why today people go and protest. Because you're telling me I have a right to education. But the fact of the matter is if I don't have funds, I can't access that institution. You're telling me I have a right to basic water. But the fact of the matter is if I don't have employment and cannot afford my meetings, you're going to shut down the water. And so the Bill of Rights must materialize and find expression in people's lives. Then we can somewhat say we've progressed this nation. But so long as those rights are not materialized and they're based on what you have, it's a problem. And justice must be seen to be given. I'm not trying to advocate for justice, but I'm showing you why I wanted to study law and why I chose to go to university. And so I wanted to actually go study in Joburg because I wanted to go far away from home. You know that nice thing? Freedom. Yes. So this was me. 
this, I applied, I applied in steel and wash, I applied in the WC, I was ready. So I'm either going to do um, chemical engineering, I'm going to study law. I got accepted. I come to my father, I'm excited, Papa, I'm going to varsity. He's like, where? So I tell him, he's like, mm, I don't think so. Sure. You don't have money? No, no, we can always make plans. But don't you think it's better to just go here down the road at Nelson Mandela University? I know the truth now is because he was too scared that I'm a girl and I'm going to go out to the world, I'm going to lose myself, etc. So I stuck it out. I didn't speak to him for a week. I, I, I honestly didn't and it was awkward <laughs> for my mother at least. And I got to varsity in my first year. I think I signed up for probably like 10 societies. I, I, was, I, was, act, I was ready to become active and involved. So I was involved. Except for polit political parties, I, 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 I wasn't involved in it. So I signed up for debating Toastmasters, uh, Law Society, Black Lawyers, Student Association, um, STASM. I signed up for sports. Yeah, I thought I'd play tennis, but it didn't work out. Um, and so I joined these societies because I wanted to become a holistic individual. I wanted to, I understood at that level even that employers are not looking for a bookworm. You want someone who's a team player, someone who can be an innovation, innovate, become innovative rather, in that workspace. And so I wanted to build and develop myself and become that person so that if you see my CV, if I'm in an interview, I already get the job. And I wanted to get the job not because I was a black female, ne? you know this quota thing, an affirmative action. I'm not anti-affirmative action, but I wanted to get a job because it's the best qualified candidate for that post. We need to really become and get to that point that even if someone says ah oh, it's a black person no one questions why you're in that position because you're the best fit individual to be there so that's why i was determined to join all these societies and i was very active in the law society i really love policy and the constitution and so i was involved in that i went to student parliament if you think parliament with the eff is chaotic let's go to student parliament and you sit there what is going on at this level at this age we're really fighting about Marx, but, but guys, Marx is not going to feed an, a hungry student. It's good to debate ideology, but let's debate solutions so that we can actually advance the country. We can dis discuss the past, but it should not determine our future because we're not liberated to vote for the Liberation Party, but liberated to have the freedom to choose who we want to, us to be and to serve us. And it's something fundamental that if someone liberates you, you must be liberated, then you must liberate yourself from the liberated because they continuously have a hold on you. So if someone gives you a job, please uh, don't go via back doors to get that job because they'll constantly always have a hold on you. But if you know you did it genuinely, you are transparent, you are accountable, you have a peace of mind because you don't owe anyone anything. Now, fast track, I had a best friend who was very smart. She got straight A's. She came from a very, very poor family. Second semester in our second year, I did not see her. I made attempts to speak to her, but she didn't have a phone. I found out four months later that she had left varsity because she could not afford it. And this was problematic to me. And I went to the SRC to present this case that there's a young woman who can't afford varsity. And in simple terms, I was asked to pay in kind to, assist, to get the case advanced. I don't know if you understand what I mean. And the, the tone boy was like, what? No, no, chief, can you, can you repeat yourself? No, leader, can you repeat yourself? Yeah, I just get this problematic. Bro, well, I'm like, so how many cases were actually dealt and handled in that manner? That if that, I didn't have money to bribe you or wasn't willing to engage in sexual intercourse with you, I would not be helped. And so for me that day, as much as I did not like politics because of what I saw at home, I said, I'm going to get into the SRC. I'm going to change the status quo and I'm going to represent students to the best of my ability. And I joined a political party. I'm not here to campaign. Um, <laughs> based on its values, its principles, and more than anything, the kind of leadership I saw in them, they did not speak something and walk a different path. That which they spoke is that which they practiced. Today we have a problem in our leaders. 
that I will stand in front of you and I will campaign and I will sell you dreams. You will vote for me, I get into power and I've forgotten about you. And I would urge most of you to go read the book called Animal Farm. It's brilliant. Now, two minutes. <laughs> SRC was tough in 2014. I was the only female in my caucus, but that was not what bothered me. But the brutality and the undermining and the questioning of my capacity in what I say. And we saw governance under people who do not care for students. SRCs have a budget. We had a budget of three million. Two million was charged in less than four months on drinking, um, partying, and enjoying themselves and not serving students. And so I was asked and convinced for days to run as a president. And for me, the biggest problem was, well, what is my family going to say? So I didn't tell my parents. Uh, my face was with posters all over campus. And I came home one day with a blue t-shirt. They're like, huh, come on. I was like, oh, by the way, I just won elections as well. What? And, you know, I sat down with them and I explained that my parents are very understanding and very liberal. So we all vote the same thing now. And uh, so even, <laughs> even, even to our parents, we can always learn something from each other. And it's something I always argue in parliament that we can always, maybe 50 years old and I'm 24, but we can constantly teach each other something. And we need to be very open and honest as leaders, as CEOs, and I know some of you are here, directors, have a, have a willingness and patience to listen. Some of these young people sitting here have brilliant ideas that will transform society. And so I became SRC president. September, we, we won the election. In October, I drafted my strategic document that outlined what was my vision and my seven strategic objectives. We got into SRC, we had NASFAS. We all know NASFAS, eh? Ah, it's a problem. Um, so NASFAS centralized itself was a pilot project. There are more than 2,000 students who are about to go home because they didn't have funding. So I spoke to the SRC. We took 400,000 rand from our funds. We went to the vice chancellor. We said, you have 400,000 rand, double this. And that week we had 1.2 million. We went to NASFAS and said, we have this money. You need to triple this because you're killing students. In less than a month, we raised 9 million and helped over 1,400 students. And so obviously that, that made people sort of question, Who, who's, who's this girl? What, what are they doing there? And we continuously worked to serve the youth of South Africa. We understood even then that beyond being students, we're members of society. And societal problems also are problems. And so we continuously did groundwork, um, outreach. Um, I still feel like nine months is the shortest time. Um, I don't know, and yet you can achieve. You can honestly achieve. We did a lot. We even retained governance. And I wanted to step down because if you, I believe that if you do something, do it perfectly the first time around. So I was not going to take term two. I played my part. I excelled where I, where I could, and I didn't where I, could, I couldn't. And obviously there were issues then because people felt that you were a female president, yet you didn't drive female issues. I was like, what do you mean? Well, you only had a gala dinner and a workshop and a mentee program. I was like, okay, when you voted for me, were you voting because I was female? Or were you voting for me to serve all students? It's a constant battle even now because I'm sometimes seen in Parliament as a youth rep uh, and not as an official member of Parliament. There's constant undermining. Um, by the way, the process to get there is difficult. I respect well, MPs, at least from my party, because others, you just go to a branch meeting, Viva, I'm in. <laughs> not to discredit that, it's good. The people must, must vote you in, but post that. Can we check the passion? Can we check the genuineness behind you wanting to serve? You see, when you're an MP, you're a public servant. I choose and elect to be of service to the next person. So I can't have the freedom or privilege to say, no, I've, I've got to attend to my family or I've got to attend to my personal issue because I've dedicated my life, my strength, and my passion to serve my country. And that's something we are lacking today even in our workspaces, that we are not passionate or understand fundamentally why we are doing what we are doing. And so sometimes you find that we get very much depressed, we get uncomfortable and unhappy because we're not following your true passion and your true dream. 
and I was fortunate enough to be allowed in my family to follow it. Lastly, each generation must add a relative or two to discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. In my opening, I indicated that we find ourselves during a critical time in South Africa. And one must understand that when I say that, it's not with any pleasure, but with great concern. If you think all is well, you have not seen anything. If you think what happens in society or in politics or in governance does not affect you, you are mistaken. By the way, lawmakers are politicians. There's everything we do is regulated by law and ultimately politics. Even the Companies Act is made in parliament by politicians. It affects us fundamentally. I'm not saying let's all go save Viva Comrade or be active. I'm saying let's be conscious and active citizens who become solutions to the problem. We are not all going to sit in parliament. We are not all going to sit in board meetings. We are not all going to be directors. But in the space that you find yourself in, in that little corner office on the ground floor where sometimes you're asked to make coffee as if you're an intern there, have a purpose there. Shine in the midst of the space you are in. Become a beacon of hope to not only to those you work with. Let people be surprised. Why, why is she so happy? With 6,000 rand, Sana, and you must still pay rent for 3.5. People must question, where does this happiness come from? Where does this zeal to get to work an hour before to prepare and be the last one to leave? Where does it come from? It's when you fundamentally understand that you're all designed and created for a purpose. And the fact that you're still alive, by the way, means you have not fulfilled your mission. You're still alive. Get up, work harder. Fulfill that mission of yours. Fulfill that purpose, particularly as a generation to young people here. This is our country. It is us who are going to be parents in the next 20 years. If you don't take charge of this country today, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to be in trouble. If you don't take an active role in becoming an agent of change, then I fear that we would not, rather would have betrayed our own mission. Honestly, there's no true freedom in poverty. There's no true freedom in unemployment. There's no true freedom in sitting at home without an education due to the circumstances of your birth. There's no true freedom when young women die on a daily basis. There's no true freedom when you're scared to walk freely in our country, to engage in spaces, and to be true to ourselves. There's no true freedom when those who are elected to represent us do not fulfill their mission. There's no true freedom when you're denied an opportunity simply because you're a certain gender or class or ethnicity. Your profession, there will come a time where it wouldn't matter who you are and where you come from, but we'll be bound by the fact that we're all human beings. And I would like to urge each and every one of us here to understand that indeed the country is in trouble. Africa is in trouble. And it's up to each and every one of us to come together, to stand up for one another, to support each other for the sake of future generations and for our own sake. Please. Don't let your success cloud you. Don't let material things cloud you. Yes, you may succeed, and I believe each and every one of you sitting here will succeed. But your success must also reflect in your society. Your success must be reflected in that community you're coming from, that village you're coming from. Some of you will become the first graduates in your families. Don't undermine that because you become a beacon of hope to a child who has to walk nine kilometers to go to school to a child who doesn't know where their first, next meal is coming from. I'm not saying those who can afford do not have challenges, far from it. Each and every one of us here has barriers and challenges, but let's use our talents and gifts to make a difference, to become something. I'm only 24, it's difficult and I can't do it by myself. We need more people to challenge the system. We need more people to become a voice for the voiceless, to become advocates, and to stand up. I would really like to commend each and every one of you sitting here. I saw, I saw that process um, and those steps that were being explained. It's difficult, it's not easy. It's, I think about 3,500 applicants, and you're in the top 100. <sighs> if you don't give yourself a pat on the back for that, I don't know what you want. Even if you're not in the top 10, it's fine. By the way, you might be the boss of that person who was in the top 10. 
<laughs> then, then you remind each other. It's fine. Don't, 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 don't get fixated with that. Even if you're thinking, Ish, I don't even know where I'm going to work next year or what I'm going to do or how I'm going to write my next test, it's fine. But the fact that you're here, I, I, I commend you. I want to wish you all everything of the best um, in your efforts to benefit and to improve your lives. And I want to thank the sponsors. You see, a problem in South Africa, we think money fixes things. Eh? If there's a problem with this, people just throw in money. And when I was reading about the purpose of this project, I realized the fundamental impact it has to change, not simply how I perform, but how I think, which is what's different about it. It is not another, you know, those, those programs, those leadership things, just not another process passing by, but it's actually got a fundamental impact. I've seen the top 100 from last year, they're doing very well. And so keep up the good work. Uh, to those who are bored, I do sincerely apologize. <laughs> um, but to those who've listened, I really hope we can take this. I know sometimes you get inspired for two hours and you think, yo, I'm going to do it. I got this. You get home, you continue with the same pattern. It happens to all of us. But let's please not try to fall into that trap. Um, thank you very much, Laura, and thank you to all the organizers. It looks very spectacular, although it's quite romantic if you're not there. <laughs> but no, thank you, and I really wish you all genuinely the best, and I hope in 20 years' time uh, we'll be high-fiving each other in a more equal and socially just world. <laughs>